and really looking to where these candidates stand in, in depth and not on when they stop beating their mother and all that stuff, okay? So Jennifer, there, if I call her Jennifer, that's charity, okay? I'm too old for this. And Ricky, okay? Yes, please sit down and I'll, pass, I'll start with one and I'll pass the mic, you know, I'll alternate questions. So, Oh, I warned these guys, I gave them, this is the one question I told them that I'd be giving them. What federal agencies would they eliminate and they're free to justify it and prioritize if they will? So the spirit of your question, Ian, is about the crushing national debt, which is a problem most Americans have diagnosed, but we as a party have to deal with. It's really responsible of us to be having this discussion. Um, I can tell you the first, one of the first votes that I would like to have as a member of Congress would be to terminate the $500 million loan back guarantee program that went to green companies like Solyndra. It was utter waste. Uh, and it was political favoritism. There were companies that were able to line the pockets of certain politicians and get favorable treatment. Now, um, I think just itemizing is a drop in the bucket. This problem is a lot bigger than any alphabet soup agency uh, song that we can uh, we can engage in right here. What I would tell you is the structural reform that we need to do to balance the budget. What I'm advocating for this campaign is a firm balanced budget requirement. More than 40 states have it. The federal government should have it too. Um, I'm advocating for sunset provisions on major pieces of federal legislation. Let's phase things out over time. I'm also talking about a line item veto. I think the president should have that power to extract spending waste from appropriations measures. Uh, I'm talking about a single subject rule. I, I don't like the log rolling that happens where programs and policies are added on the back end of legislation. Uh, that disrupts public trust. And it also adds to the budgetary mess we're in today. So, there's a structural approach, which is overarching, but that's an example. I think the, the cylinder alone is something that uh, defies imagination. It's something we should not be supporting. I would eliminate. I'm going to add. It's better to stand up. They can't see you back here. I can see that. You will. Know, after this, I'm going to add. <laughs> so first, I'd like to. Um, I wish you could be here with y'all since I came up with work last minute, so I'll be here in this place answering these questions to the best of my ability. So um, federal uh, agencies are eliminated. The Department of Education has not proven that, uh, has not been, there's no evidence that has uh, improved education at all, and we think the solution to education is to localize it, more local power, the funds go back to the states, so and they can use them uh, on their children's education, how they would like to spend them. Um, the other uh, agency is the EPA. It's, it's regulations are getting out of hand, taking away your freedom. They are uh, crippling our businesses. So we'd really like to see that one uh, disappear as well. Unplanned addendum to the question. Could you, what, would you, what would you think of weighing every piece of existing and other legislation as much as possible against the provision for it in the Constitution, and it's not constitutional out of code. This is the same question. Well, I have a great reverence for the Constitution. It's not only our founding document, it is. Well, At the audience is urging. Um, look, I have a great reverence for the Constitution for several reasons. You know, it's, uh, it is not just a founding document, it is the blueprint for how our representative form of government works. And it clearly has for 225 years, going on uh, for a long period of time. What we really need to do is appreciate that these regulatory agencies were not imagined by our founding fathers. We know that. It's been considered the fourth branch of government. And so we're talking about real regulatory reform in our campaign. Um, I've talked about every major piece of uh, federal rulemaking should go back to your elected representatives in Congress and the House and Senate for up or down floor votes. I think we should have regulatory caps so that every new rule of a 
of substantial impact. Maybe we could swap that out for uh, for an old one. Take for every new rule that's coming in, take one off the books. There's a regulatory neutrality that we can, you know, support in uh, in this country, but we're also announcing and articulating it in this campaign. So regulations have gotten in the way of small business. We all know that. Uh, we're talking about meaningful, robust regulatory reform. It'll help farmers here. It's going to help small business people. When we take that compliance nightmare off their uh, off their minds, it'll be easier for them to meet and expand payroll, and that's jobs for people in this district. So it all gets back to something really fundamental. And I'm proud to talk about it in this race. I'm going to start the next question with you after you comment. So one of the things we'd like to talk about is uh, process versus our election officials. And it's important we have a good process, you know, holding our officials accountable to the Constitution. But really, at the end of the day, one of the things we really need to do to make sure that they abide by the Constitution is elect good people to office, people who respect the Constitution. I think that's the number one way we can make sure that our laws and the rules that come out of our government respect the Constitution. This is a no-brainer for Ricky, I'm sure. Health care. <laughs> what would you do as my representative <laughs> about if the national health care law is not stricken down by the Supreme Court? What would be your move in Congress? Just, just to fight it. It's, it's an absolutely terrible law. Uh, one of the worst parts that people have talked about is um, the 15% uh, profit cap uh, it puts on insurance companies, and that's really just going to kill innovation in the medical field. And that's going to hurt a lot of people that you can't see. The Democrats like to point to people that um, will, will be hurt by the law not passing. And we can't point to the people that will be hurt if it does pass. So just, we just fight it to the man Congress and try and get it to be revealed fully, and hopefully the Supreme Court will let's take it down. Right in our wheelhouse, right? Um, a couple of things. The first thing is, uh, you know, the Supreme Court's going to weigh in on this. We're on the brink of that decision. Now, um, they certainly, uh, they reserve the right to treat it as they may. As a member of Congress, here's what I would do. Uh, we should defund and repeal it. Here's why. We were sold a bill of goods with Obamacare. We really were. We were sold cost containment, yet premiums have still gone up in the state of California by 50 to 60%. Physicians were promised tort reform. Well, there was no tort reform. The lawyers had no skin in the game. You can still sue a physician excessively, uh, and that's driving up the cost of health care, too. You know, the biggest problem in health care is that it is, in a way, uh, unlike the simplicity in auto insurance, right? We all, when you watch the evening news, when you watch the Sacramento Kings or the San Francisco Giants play, you see a progressive auto commercial, or you see a uh, commercial for state farm. You know how much you're paying, you know what you're getting in return. That transparency is not at play. It is not at work in healthcare. And so we have empowered a set of people who don't know what they're getting in return for their money. Um, that's something we've got to fix. I, I want the consumer to be able to pool together with other consumers, drive down costs, drive up quality. I want a conscientious consumer in California to be able to go to South Carolina, Florida, and New York and buy cheaper insurance. Let's empower consumers to be the force for accountability. Not a bunch of bureaucrats. Obamacare's biggest flaw, uh, not only are there constitutional problems, but from a policy perspective, no cost containment. And we empower bureaucrats to tell a doctor what they can order for their patients. And I know a couple of doctors. Some of them happen to have my last name. That is not going to fly over well with them. Uh, and it's not going to fly over well with you as a patient. The question was, what will you do? Defund, deactivate, and repeal. Thank you. I, the Constitution's, this is from Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution, and it's getting us in a lot of trouble. It says, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance that he knows thereof, and all the treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. That is called the Supremacy Clause. And it causes us a lot, potentially a lot of danger. 
And, and the first question I'm asking them, in light of this is, and particularly, is how dangerous to the United States sovereignty is the United Nations? Well, we, uh, and as you know, we are one of the largest contributors to the United Nations. Um, I believe the exact percentage hovers around 20%. Uh, other countries like Japan are big contributors too. Um, ultimately, you know, this organization is one that should be more sensitive to common sense. I mean, I think a lot of folks can agree countries like Libya should not be heading up a human rights commission. Right? I mean, it just doesn't pass the smell test, right? So what we need to do is make sure that our engagement with these organizations is responsible. Uh, let's reform them so that they make sense. I mean, whether it's the Security Council, the Human Rights Commission, uh, of course, no edict from there uh, should contravene American law, right? I think the members of Congress you elect, the president that you elect, that's where the real deliberation should be happening. Uh, and, uh, and the Supremacy Clause you cited is written into the Constitution for a reason. Only the treaties that the Senate agrees to and ratifies that the President has signed, only those treaties should be binding upon the American people. Um, and that is not just me saying that, that is a fundamental tenet of American law. I'm going to ask you so the United Nations has become about control. Agenda 21 integration has become a tool of the left to impose their agenda on us without us being able to vote on it or representatives being able to vote on it. Um, I actually have a personal example down in Texas. Some of my friends are working for Ted Cruz. He's a Senate candidate. And um, in Texas, uh, the World Court came in to the United Nations and said we couldn't put the death penalty on um, an illegal alien who had brutally raped and murdered some people. And Texas sentenced him to the death penalty, but they came in and said, no, you can't do that. Well, this guy, Ted Cruz, he's a conservative all star, um, fought it, and we won. But that's just, it's just an example of how they're trying to come in here and control and get more power. So I think the, the correct thing to do about them then is um, to just not be part of it. Don't give them power. Starve them of power. We shouldn't have anything to do with it. It's just no more, no more of that. Right? <laughs> I didn't really mean this to be informational, but in 1952, are any of you familiar with the Brickrow Amendment? It was an amendment, a proposed amendment to the Constitution in 1952 that failed the Senate by one vote. And in it, they basically, it was provisions that anything that was contrary to our Constitution could not be acknowledged as a treaty, treated as a treaty. In 1952, and it was Eisenhower, a Republican, he campaigned in favor of it and pushed against it. It failed by one vote. We need it again. But that's that's the stuff. I was going to have you comment on the Ripper Amendment, but I think I think I know what you mean. Anyhow. Okay. Pardon? It's new. Thank you. I'm having a time keeping. Okay. In light of the supremacy clause. Would you address uh, the treaties and the treaty law and the danger of some treaties, like the law of the sea treaty, the small arms control treaty, the move to return the um, Mount Rushmore to the indigenous people, the, and other other treaties, and that you can address it in any way you want. Yeah, I just think America is best suited to solve its own problems, and we don't need to listen to some uh, global organization to tell us what to do. And just let's let's decide for ourselves what we want to do about our own problems. If there are treaties, we must obey them now. Well, getting back to process, and for treaties to be binding upon the American. It has to be ratified by the Senate. It gets back to our process. We need to be sending good people to Washington to know the implications of every treaty. Uh, and they're going to be willing to fight for American sovereignty. Um, and on key issues, uh, you know, when the UN uh, is deliberating, it's incumbent upon the president to nominate someone who's going to really stand up for our best interest there. You know, former President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, one of his most relevant sets of experiences was 
uh, fighting for American sovereignty and our interests as UN ambassadors. So we've got to uh, send the right people there who are going to defend our interests. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, reserve the right at the treaty level to object in the Senate when something doesn't pass as well. This is my favorite and most important question. What is your reaction to the suggestion that the United States get out of the UN? Well, here's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see more responsible engagement with that global institution. On issues like Agenda 21, they should not be stripping our sovereignty. There's only one candidate in my race who's you know, really thought that private property rights in a real public way, and that's myself. I'm very proud to cite that. We had an issue between Lodi and Stockton where uh, two city governments, and perhaps the county, were trying to, uh, you know, zone people out of their private property rights, which I objected to. And so that was a very public stance I've taken. Um, I think that informs my view of something that is very important to our system of government. The reason we exist as a country is we believe in private property. And uh, so we need more constructive engagement. Uh, we need to be demanding more of the UN than we're giving, because we're funding 20% of the organization's annual budget. And, uh, and so I think that's what you would see from me. Yes.
<laughs> yeah. What measures would you advocate to uh, solve our nearly $16 trillion national debt? These might be a little redundant. You heard these prescriptions earlier, but they are the core of this campaign. If we don't reduce spending, we're going to create a situation where government is competing with the private market for capital. It's going to hurt job creation. It's going to hurt the next generation. It's a credit card we just can't afford anymore. So what we're talking about is a balanced budget requirement. Uh, we've talked about that at the state level. It should work at the federal level, too. Uh, I want to review all federal agencies and programs on the books. That's part of the general sunset provision. Uh, I want a line item veto so that the president can discipline people like Jerry McNerney who put in spending provisions at the 11th hour uh, that are wasteful. Uh, the president should have that right to, uh, to line item veto and strike out waste. Um, I'm also discussing a single subject rule. You know, the process is broken where you've got uh, an energy bill that has part of it pertaining to health care and part of it on foreign aid. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. It should be one bill, one topic. And then we'll have an appropriate discussion about what is a really, what is truly a national priority. Um, so, so, you know, we can sit here and talk all day about particular niche issues, but we need a process <laughs> that commands your respect, and that is uh, it's something we can be proud of in the 21st century. You know, we can track a package halfway around the world. We don't even know what's in the federal budget. And when, and, and, and when I win this race, I'd be honored to have your trust, but I also would be uh, someone who's going to be a real advocate for budget because it's the next generation of the state, too. So, once again, this is kind of a process versus people issue. I mean, you can say we like a balanced budget amendment. You know, my dad, he's for it as well. But who knows when that's going to get passed? We need to get people in. America's in a debt crisis. We need to get people in there now who are willing to cut, who are willing to address entitlements. You know, we, had, we only had 22 patriots vote against the debt ceiling when it came up last time. My dad would be among those if he was elected. Ricky Gill here said he would have reluctantly voted for it. We need more people who will stand for it no matter what. Who will get the, our spending under control now and not wait around for it. Last question, and it's really an easy one. What, as a congressman, can you, would you do about the unemployment problem? Okay, there are so many things. Okay, one of the one of the big things we can do immediately is 21% um, of our, com our economy is uh, young companies, venture capital funded companies, but we have really wounded ourselves on this. Sarbanes-Oxley has killed 2 million jobs, many of those California jobs, in the last 10 years. Um, that was a bipartisan piece of legislation. It should be easy to refill. That's something we can do immediately to help kickstart that part of the economy again. Another is energy. Energy is another huge part of our economy. We, we don't take care of our own energy needs, and if we did, that'd be many, many, many jobs. Build nuclear plants, drill at home. These are things we can do right away to get the economy going. And then, of course, we have so many structural issues with regulations, uh, taxes, that can be addressed as well. But there's a lot we can do to do. <laughs> you know, when Jerry McNerney first got elected, the green jobs he talked about were green energy jobs. I know you were all here for that election in 06, but he talked about tens of thousands of green jobs coming to San Joaquin County. Well, there was just a report that was released that said only 60 came over the course of six years. <laughs> so this really hasn't worked for us. The green jobs I talked about are agriculture. You know, I learned the value of a dollar on a family farm. Uh, it's a core part of this economy. Jerry McNerney has an F rating from the Farm Bureau on everything that they're pushing from trade and less regulation to reducing the estate tax. He's been a bad vote, and we got to replace him. Uh, to be honest, uh, the peripheral canal is something that I talk about uh, in opposition. Uh, you know, it's going to cost this community 13,000 jobs if it's built overnight. It took Jerry McNerney five years to get on the floor of Congress and denounce the peripheral canal. Um, it was actually much to my surprise when. John McDonald got into this race, one of the first things he started printing about was his support for the principles of the Purple Canal. We cannot afford more of our water going to south of the Delta. It's going to kill our agriculture base. We've got to fight to preserve the real green jobs. That is agriculture. We've got to reduce the debt burden. We've got to fight to relieve businesses of the regulatory burden. And we've got to educate our children for the next generation. I talk a lot about charter schools. And we are failing a generation of students in this district. And if they're not educated and equipped, uh, they are going to be a drag on us. And I'm going to focus on that kind of prudent investment. Now I would like the state candidates to come up and 
the, the meal, I'm sorry, some of you are going to starve today. <laughs> I'm sorry, closing statements. I wanted them to tell you. I'll let them make their closing statements, period. I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, there is zero engineers in Congress. My dad is electrical engineer by training, executive uh, by practice now. You know, I, I've seen his passion for this country. It's, it's remarkable. He really has a depth of knowledge I've never seen before. And it's not just because he's my dad. I'm telling the truth. And I would really, you know, I think he's uniquely qualified to go to Congress and really address our issues in a way you haven't seen before. I think his narrative needs to be on the national scene. Um, so I really hope, I really hope you uh, join me and support him. I want to address a few things. I think it's interesting Ricky says you got a dose of, do, uh, dose of truth from his campaign. He recently attacked us and there were five things he put on there and all of them were lies. Um, so I'd like to uh, address that briefly. Uh, he said my dad switched parties. My dad dropped his registration to decline to stay under Bush because he was so upset about the um, Harriet uh, Myers nomination. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's that part of the decision. He said my dad for the Purple Canal. Um, he originally came out in support of the Purple Canal, but he has, uh, he, he's looked at it and um, it's about false choices. His, his position is we need more water storage, we need an overall water solution. Isolated the Purple Canal is not the answer to get against it. But it's, um, it's basically just a lie to say. My dad is supportive. It's, it's, it's slimy. Um, other thing he says, my dad is not against new taxes. My dad is absolutely against taxes. Any of you have heard him say that? Uh, no, he's against taxes. My dad is for Obamacare. That's another thing. Any of you have heard my dad speak? No, he's always been strongly against Obamacare. Um, I'm just personally excited that uh, if, if you're going to attack a campaign, you got to do it on the truth, not on lies. Um, we give you that respect. We'd like to say. But I hope you support my dad. If you want to read more about us or about um, uh, Ricky, you can see in our newspaper. We have it on the side. Um, thank you for listening today. Uh, for more information, you can also go to johnstonpointbelt.com. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, you know, this campaign we started on May 17, 2011. Actually, I think we're on close to it's been almost a year. We started with a core idea, which was that in the newly drawn 9th district, we could finally represent ourselves. You know, when I announced there wasn't a single legislator who lived here, not, not anyone in Sacramento, not anyone in Washington, we really had no proxies who lived like us. We were the most underrepresented people in the country. And, uh, you know, I'm a young guy, but that's a, that's a principle that's as old as this country. That's what we're running to defend. Uh, we are... Uh, We've, we're running a campaign that's got Jerry McNerney on the ropes. We continue to put pressure on him. Uh, the Democratic machine, including George Soros, is already attacking me, actually. It tells you something. More than half a year before the general election, they have resolved to, uh, to come after me. And it's because we're about to make Jerry McNerney an endangered species himself. You know? So I would, I would humbly ask for your support because I think a new generation of leadership is exactly what this community is hungry for. We want people who are going to go there with a clean conscience, who believe that politics is about sacrifice and service. And uh, if I've learned anything from my family in this community, which I've always called home, it is that honor counts for something, that the truth will always prevail, and that ultimately this ballot can represent itself. It sounds like a novel idea, but it's because we've been deprived that seat at the table for a long time. If you'd like to get involved, please join us at rickygill.com. We'd be humbled to have your support. And, uh, I need more advocates out there. I hope to count you up. Thank you so much.